Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. This has been um, a really fun research project to work on. So I'm going to share my screen and let's let's get this going. Can everyone see my screen properly? Yes. Okay. So the talk that I'm focusing on today is on the major reorganization over Miocene and Pliocene time periods um, of the Snake and Columbia River system. We think a lot of the drivers for this relate to isostasy, so how the Earth's crust goes up and down due to various different geodynamic mechanisms. One of the big players in this system is the Yellowstone hotspot, which I know you all know at least a little bit about and possibly a whole lot about. Methods I mostly I'm going to be talking about are detrital zircon provenance analysis, which I will explain, and fish fossil assemblages. Um, and so this work is largely uh, focused on some of the research I do for the US Geological Survey on landscape evolution. And I've got some great co-authors, um, Jim O'Connor, Chris Holmdenoma, and Charlie Cannon are also USGS employees. And John Lasher and Gerald Mary Alexander are really just geologic enthusiasts. They don't uh, they, they've just come along with me on the ride in the field and collected samples with me and that kind of thing. So, um, and another thing I want to mention is that this is uh, this research that I'm going to be talking about today. It's very recently published in the Geological Society of America Bulletin. Uh, so this is the sort of the, um, the uh, title of that particular paper. If you're interested, uh, it's open access. Uh, so anyone can download it. There's no paywall to that particular article in the journal. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the details, um, feel free to look this paper up. So I just first wanted to start with a um, geographic primer on what sort of large scale river systems we're looking at. Uh, here we have a topographic map of the Pacific Northwest uh, with purple colors being high elevation and blue and greenish tones being low elevation. And here I'm highlighting some of the larger river systems in the Snake and Columbia River Basin. So we've got the Snake River that's highlighted is a thicker teal colored line. Um, and I'm gonna see if I can get my laser pointer going here. Can you guys see this here? Hopefully. Um, so the Snake River, it starts near the Yellowstone hotspot tracks its way across the front of the Tetons, enters the Snake River Plain, and it carves the deepest canyon in North America, which is Hell's Canyon, located right here. Um, and it and fin finally connects into the Columbia Basin system through this conduit currently. But as early as 1898, geoscientists noticed there were some funny features about the Snake River, specifically near Hell's Canyon. And so I'm gonna zoom in to this region right here in the next map. So here, this is the same kind of topographic map again. Here we have the Snake River as this thick teal line going from south to north. Um, that's the flow direction currently. But what geoscientists early on noticed was that there are these features called barbed tributaries. And so I've highlighted a few. There's one called Wild Horse Creek down here, Pine Creek and Indian Creek here. And these are called barbed tributaries because um, it, they flow, they, they look like they flow to the south but then they hook or they get barbed and flow to the north. So these have been identified in a lot of different places in the world. And they have been used to suggest that a river system has flowed the opposite direction in the past, basically when these tributaries were first established. And we find these specifically on the south side of Hell's Canyon. So that would suggest that the river system at some point flowed from north to south rather than from south to north along this particular stretch of the Snake River. Another thing that folks noticed fairly early on is that there's this really large uh, sequence of lake and fluvial or, or river sediments uh, located upstream of Hell's Canyon. Um, and they identified that there was this really large lake system in the Western Snake River Plain um, between Miocene and Pliocene time, specifically between about 10 million years ago to about two and a half million years ago. And so they call this Lake Idaho. So there's a really, really big lake system there. So if the Snake River currently connects to the Columbia Basin through the Hell's Canyon, but there was some period of time in which the flow direction was opposite of what it currently is, at least on the south side of Hell's Canyon, then one question that we're going to address, or I'm going to try to address, is where did the Snake River go? 
And when did Hell's Canyon incise? This is again, the deepest canyon in North America. So here I've got a topographic map showing the high elevation portions of the um, Seven Devils Mountains, about 2,800 meters high. And then the lowest point in some of uh, parts of the Hell's Canyon are, are about 400 meters. So this is a bunch of topography. Um, and then for reference, we have the Grand Canyon as this dotted line, just one of the um, topographic profiles across it. And so there's some differences. Uh, one Hell's Canyon is a little bit deeper, uh, just a little bit, but it's also quite a bit steeper. So we want to know when did this happen? When did this big incision event happen? So there have been some previous hypotheses on where the Snake River went in the past. One of the early ones uh, was suggested by as early as 18, or, um, 1928 by Livingston. And so here I, in this map, I have the Snake River again in teal along its modern path here. So the Livingston hypothesis is called the West of the Wallawas or the Baker Valley route. And the idea here was that, uh, suggested initially by Livingston, was that the river, instead of going through Hell's Canyon, went along this other path through the Baker Valley, through the, through the Powder River Valley, and possibly through the Grand Ronde River system, and connected um, instead sort of on the other side of the Wallawa Mountains. When we look at a topographic profile, this, pre, this post um, route makes a little bit of sense. So here, this is a topographic profile going uh, from with elevation on the y-axis and distance from on the x-axis. The modern Snake River, again, is in teal right here. So basically we're going from the headwaters to the Pacific Ocean over here. And this is sort of just the topography that the river currently goes along. And this pink polygon right over here is the topography extracted from DEMs along this hypothesized route. And so when we look at it, the, the passes along this way, or the high elevation points, are just a little bit higher than the maximum estimated elevation of Lake Idaho. So this is potentially a route in which, you know, if Lake Idaho was just a touch uh, higher than what is thought, then it could have potentially flowed over this direction. The other hypothesis that's um, fairly prominent in the literature is that the Snake River flowed out through the Owyhee River system across parts of the basin and range, and eventually over the Sierra Mountains and joining into the Sacramento River system. A lot of the data sets that have been used for this come from fish, uh, existing and fossil fish. And so basically there are some fish uh, that live within the Sacramento River system that are actually quite similar to those found in Pleistocene and Miocene Lake Idaho. So to get those, those little fishies from point A to point B, this is the proposed route. When we look at the topographic profile of this purple route, it's right over here. And so there's quite a bit of more elevation and distance sort of to get um, from, from you know, what we see as um, the elevation of, of what the modern river system looks like and how it could have possibly gone to the Sacramento route. So if the Sacramento hypothesis is in fact correct, then it could mean one of two things. Either the maximum lake level of Idaho, of Lake Idaho was dramatically higher than previously estimated, or there's been quite a bit of topographic uplift of this intervening region since Pliocene time. So those are some of the previous hypotheses that have been suggested. And one of the interesting things that we can look at is, is not just you know, where the river went, but what, what could have driven it to change over time. So rivers can respond to different topographic drivers in similar ways. And I have a few different like little cartoons of block diagrams showing some of the different processes that have been suggested for you know, why the Snake River has changed its course over time. This top one is one of tectonic uplift. So if you have um, a fault system, not just one fault, but perhaps a, a series of faults, and you have uplift that is fast enough, it could potentially defeat a, a, current, a, a river course and divert it, creating a lake system in, in the background. Similarly, if we have volcanic flows, that perhaps clog a canyon system, it, this could potentially also be another way in which we divert a river system. Um, and also since the Miocene and Pliocene time periods in the Pacific Northwest and Northern Rocky Mountains were highly volcanically active, this, um, this is a, a possible route. And actually this is one of the earliest proposed ideas of why the Snake River changed. And then there's this other idea of thermal plumes. So if we just go back a touch uh, to this figure right here, one of the things I plotted here that I forgot to point out was that the Yellowstone hotspot has actually not been stationary with respect to North America over time. So Yellowstone currently located at the National Park over here, but it's made a track through North America over time. And so there's a couple different volcanic centers that I've highlighted here. One is the Peekaboo Volcanic Center, then there's the Heise Volcanic Center, and then there's a the current sort of Yellowstone area. 
And so as this thermal plume has made its way through uh, North America, it creates a lot of, it brings a lot of heat from deep in the crust and it brings a lot of thermal buoyancy to the crust. So that causes uplift. And so that's another proposed idea as to why we might be getting major drainage reorganization. And my title, of course, is giving away that this is part of the major picture of what's going on here. But so one of the things that I want to also, you know, sort of bring home is that to understand what the, which one of these drivers is really important to the systems that we're looking at, we have to look at not just one data set, but multiple different data sets, integrate different types of analyses together, and also look at fairly large spatial scales, because all of these different systems are going to be um, funneling downstream to uh, the Columbia Basin and the Columbia River Gorge, and perhaps even into the Pacific Ocean. So the main methods I want to talk about today and that we've used is to use sedimentology, provenance, and paleontology. So in sedimentology, we're looking at what is the depositional environment? Are we in a lake? Are we in a river? And how does it change over time? So on this photo from the right, this is in, near the um, Arlington, uh, Oregon. This is a, a, it's just a nice example in which we see some really um, low energy lacustrine environments overtopped by this big river gravel that's scouring nicely into it. So this is an example of a place where we're seeing a big change in environment um, in the river systems. This also in this figure, this is gigantic tephra on the bottom that's almost pure glass. And so this is a good example of accurate depositional ages. So knowing exactly when that change happens and being able to correlate it to another basin or another site nearby perhaps is one of the important things that we're looking at in the sedimentology. A lot of my work has been focused um, also on the detrital zircon provenance analysis. So in this figure, what I'm showing is a whole bunch of little zircon crystals. This is a cathodoluminescence image that sort of brings out some of the internal features of the um, zircon crystals themselves. And the way we use zircon ages that are derived from this analysis is, is, um, is to use them to understand what sort of upstream geology is being eroded into a river system. And it's basically figuring out where the river came from, what part of the landscape is it draining. And so in this analysis, we've compared a lot of modern river systems. So we're collecting modern river sand to ancestral river systems collected from the sandstones throughout the region. And I'll go into a lot more detail of specifically what we've done there too. And then lastly, I wanna talk about the paleontology too. A lot of the previous hypotheses have been generated from understanding fish fossils and also other aquatic biota like little rodents and stuff like that. And so the idea here is basically to identify common or divergent fossil assemblages. So if two basins were connected by a river, then they would have similar um, fish living in those different places. But if two basins are isolated from each other, then you can get uh, basically evolution of these fish species to their local environments and we call this divergence. Since a lot of the previous work has been focused on that, I thought I would start with talking just about what's been done with the paleontology. And again, this mostly comes from fish, mollusk, and rodent species, um, which are very useful for understanding drainage patterns because those, those sorts of creatures tend to be intricately tied to the river systems that they live near or in. So instead of looking at big, nice fossils like this, this was one from the McKay beds um, in Eastern Oregon. Some of the fossils we're looking at are super tiny. So this is a little blow up image of this. This is a little fish fossil from um, the Granger clay beds near Granger, Washington. So a lot of the previous work has been detailed fossil analyses on these tiny, tiny creatures. A lot of these materials have been collected from Miocene and Pliocene lake and river sediments. Um, so these little fish um, cartoons are um, locations where some of the major fossil assemblages have been identified. A lot of them come from Lake Idaho, but there's also a big lake system that existed in the Columbia Basin. I call it Paleo Lake Ringgold because it's mostly cataloged by the Ringgold Formation. And this previous work has suggested that Lake Idaho and, lake, uh, and the Columbia Basin were isolated from each other until about 3 million years ago. And so that's, that's when people think that Hell's Canyon was finally incised. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on what's been found. Lake Idaho actually had two phases. Um, it, and cataloged by two different uh, stratigraphic units. One is called the Chalk Hills Formation. It was deposited between about 10 to about six and a half million years ago. And the fossils found in the Chalk Hills Formation include five different landlocked salmon species. So when we think about salmon today, we think about creatures that live part of their life cycle in the ocean and part of their life cycle on, on land. And so 
what we talk, mean about landlocked species, what that indicates is that there may have previously been previously been a connection between Lake Idaho and uh, during Chalk Hill's time and the Pacific Ocean, but for some period of time it was cut off somehow, and uh, that those uh, salmon species evolved to be more um, endemic into the lake system that they lived in. These fossil species also are indicative of deep oxygenated lake systems. And, um, and then overlying the Chalk Hills formation, there's another formation called the Glensbury Formation, but there is a big unconformity or basically a gap in time in which there's not a lot of sedimentary strata being deposited. So basically between about 6.5 to 4.3 million years ago, there's not a lot happening in Lake Idaho. So possibly the lake drained or evaporated somehow. Um, but the Glensferry Formation, again, it starts being deposited about 4.3 million years ago until about two and a half. So the lake got, came back and it's actually quite a bit bigger. It, it filled up much of the Western Snake River Plain. The upper stratigraphy is kind of cool. It includes a lot of cotton field terraces and a big prograding deltaic sand that's about two and a half million years ago. And those are um, stratigraphic features that are indicative of gradual lowering. So essentially the lake came back, it got really big, and then started to drain somehow, perhaps around three, three to two million years ago. Similarly, time, similar time period, about 3.3 to 2.5 million years ago, an anadromous salmon fossil with a name that I um, tried to pronounce many times and, and probably fail, um, appears in the system. And so at, at this time period, between about 3.3 and 2.5 million years ago, there seems to be a connection with the Pacific Ocean that was regained at that time. There's some other fossil data sets that are important to talk about too. One comes from the Baker Valley. So this is along that proposed route that goes west of the Wallawas. These strata are deposited between about four and a half to three million years ago. And the fossil species look different than the Snake River Plain fossils. So if the Snake River went from this basin to this basin, then you'd expect that the fossils would look similar, but in fact, they look a little bit, little bit different. So that's not very supportive of that Livingston hypothesis through this route. So divergence, and, so basically the, the fossils are, are divergent. Um, another big lake system here, again, is Lake Ringgold. It was deposited between about 9.5 to 3 million years ago, fairly continuously. And there's multiple different fossil assemblages found within this lake system. The oldest two come from uh, this location along the White Bluffs, um, along the, the modern Columbia River. It's this really beautiful exposure um, of, not surprisingly, white rock. Um, and these fossil assemblages are called the White Bluffs and the Bluff Top fossil assemblages. They're possibly, they're not super well dated, but maybe about seven to five million years of age. They don't look that similar to the the fish fossils that are uh, coeval in, in the, in the um, Lake Idaho system. And they're also warm water species. So that time period, perhaps these were not connected basin systems. But then there's enough, another fossil locality located at uh, the Taunton, which is just on the north side of the Saddle Mountains over here. It's dated also not super well, but thought to be about 3 million years, maybe 2.8 million years of age. And this is a sudden uh, emergence of fossils that are very, very similar to those in the Western Snake River Plain. So those are microtene rodents and fish fossils. And so that is one of the major data sets that have been used to identify that Hell's Canyon was incised and these river basins were connected about 3 million years ago. And they're cold water species too. So to perhaps provide a little bit more nuance to the data sets, we decided to do a bunch of detrital zircon provenance analysis. So detrital zircons are small sand size sort of grains, they're like medium sand, um, that are found very commonly in river sands. So they're, they're very common mineral, which is useful. And they're also very durable. So they, they resist erosion and they basically hang around in the geologic environment for a long time. Some of the oldest um, minerals that we've dated on earth are zircons. So the zircon ages are able to provide a unique fingerprint of upstream drainage areas. Um, if you can imagine, for example, if we have two river systems here that are coming out of a mountain, um, the geology in these two different catchments is going to be at least a little bit different. Perhaps there's a pluton over here that doesn't exist in this catchment over here. So if we have this blue catchment here and this yellow catchment here, and we collect a bag of sand um, from these different places, the zircon ages are going to be a little bit different from each other and unique to that specific river system. So basically, they're telling us where the sands came from and what landscape is being drained. 
So the samples that we've collected, there's several dozen, um, both that we've collected personally and that we've mined from the literature. A lot of the data comes from modern rivers and tributaries. And that on this map is shown as these little um, uh, yellow diamonds. So the little diamonds come from small tributaries. The bigger diamonds like these ones over here come from bigger rivers. And so we've, we've focused on mo collecting modern river sands because we know the upstream geology that's being eroded into these river systems. And that's useful for interpreting the past. So these major river systems that we've, uh, we've uh, collected from include the Snake River, of course, and the Columbia River way up here. I collected up here to get out of the sort of way of the Missoula floods. Um, we've collected from the Salmon River, the Clearwater River, the Spokane River, the Okanagan, the Methow, and the Yakima River. And so those are our major modern river systems and a whole bunch of different tributaries located uh, mostly throughout the Snake River Plain and a couple from the um, Sand River System. And we've also, of course, collected sandstones of Pleistocene to Miocene age. Uh, and these come from uh, ancestral rivers or lake systems, um, not just Lake Idaho and not just the um, Lake Ringgold, but all throughout the area. And these are shown on this map as these colorful dots. And I've just sort of color coded them based on geographically where they are. So we've got some from southwestern Montana, we've got some up here, we've got some from the Columbia Basin. This is the Ringgold Formation and other sort of similar strata. We've got some from the Columbia River Gorge region, we've got some throughout eastern Oregon. Basically I took a massive road trip and collected a lot of sand. So what's important about these, is, uh, these river sands is that we don't necessarily know the upstream drainage terrain that created these deposits, but we can compare them to the modern ones to find a little bit more out about that. So again, we're collecting sand and we sift out the zircons. Zircons tend to be really heavy, so we can use this, uh, we use gravitational separation methods to get those out. And we, we date a whole bunch of them, but we try to date about 120 zircons for each individual sample. Uh, using something called a laser ablation inductively coupled mass spectrometer. So basically we just blast our little zircons with lasers and then shove that material into a mass spectrometer and find out the age. And it's based on the uranium lead decay system. So the result is something called the detrital zircon age spectrum. And I'm showing an example, one from the Snake River here, where we've got age on the Y or on the X axis rather, going from modern times so to zero to 3.5 billion years in age. So GA, it means billion. And these little bumps here are those ages and the relative abundance. So the y-axis here is something called um, normalized probability. This is something we call technically a, a kernel density estimate is what this black line is showing here. So the, the kernel density estimate is basically in this example showing that there's a whole bunch of zircons that are about 50 million years in age. And then you know a couple over here that are maybe 450 million years in age. And then a handful that are way over here in the Archean. So that's basically what the detrital zircon ages look like when we, when we plot them up. And one of the first things we can do is we can start looking at what sort of ages we see and what sort of geology we know they might correlate to. And so again, this is a modern river sand sample. And so we can look at the upstream drainage organ, uh, regions of the, um, of the Snake River system and see sort of what could be contributing to it. And I've color coded a lot of my figures in this talk to sort of, uh, I'm a visual learner, so I, I, um, I do that a lot. So the upstream portions of the Snake River system, so basically anything in Eastern, um, Eastern Snake River Plain and from the Idaho and Wyoming Rust Belt and stuff that's way up in that catchment, I've color coded as, as deposits that are sort of pink and purple here. And they tend to be quite a bit older. So in this modern uh, Snake River sand, we've got a whole bunch of ages in this uh, zone around here. These correlate to ages that are from the Yavapai and Mazatzal age groups. Um, and these are sort of known age, uh, age groups in zircon geochronology. We've got some stuff that's coming from the Wyoming Craton or the North Belt Supergroup, and we see those ages popping up here. We've got some Grenville ages here um, that are about, you know, 1,100 million years to, you know, 1,300 million years. And then we've got a bunch of old, uh, younger age groups too. And I've color-coded uh, age groups that are coming from central Idaho, so that basically, you know, from the Idaho Batholith or some stuff that's south of the, um, of the Snake River Plain as uh, yellows, reds, and orange colors. And most of these tend to be young. There's one really important group called the Lemhi Doublet. It occurs as two concurrent age, ages. There's uh, one age that's usually a, a strong peak, 
about 1380 million years, and then a couple more ages that are uh, scattered typically between about 1650 to um, 1800 million years. So that's, that's kind of a special one, but most of them tend to be pretty young. And then there's also some age groups that uh, we know of in the Cascades, um, and I've color coded those blues. So those are stuff like the Okanagan Batholith, the Chumstick Basin, some Plutons, and Cascades, and that kind of thing. So we can start to look at these uh, zircon age groups and sort of pick at them apart. What turns out to be a little bit annoying is that a lot of the age groups in northern Idaho um, also tend to be very similar to those found in the Cascades. So it turns out these old ages turn to be the most useful ones for this detrital zircon provenance analysis. So instead of just eyeballing it, we can also use a bunch of different statistics to, to quantitatively compare our detrital zircon age spectrum. So I'm showing a couple sort of schematic diagrams of zircon age groups and what these statistics are basically measuring. So if I had a sandstone and I wanted to figure out what sort of modern river system it might be most similar to, I'm going to, I'm going to compare it to a, a few different rivers. So if I have a river, um, uh, a sandstone collected here, we'll call that my reference sample, and I compare it to rivers A, B, and C, then one of the things we want to ask is, do the age peaks in those different river systems um, line up with the sandstone? So that's something called overlap over here. And we have a ranking scheme that goes from typically uh, zero being a low score to one being a high score. So sample A or river A doesn't have age peaks that really correlate to the reference sample here. So it does a poor job. It gets basically a pretty low score. But rivers B and C do a good job of lining up with the age peak in our reference sample here. You can see they line up really nicely. And so this would get a, a fairly high score. Another question we're asking is in these statistics is, um, do the age peaks have a similar size? So are there zircons of similar abundance in these different systems? And so that's something that we call similarity. And so again, sample A does a terrible job. And then sample B and C, that both did a really good job of matching the reference sample in this sort of schematic diagram. Um, sample B has uh, zircon ages that are at much different heights or, or different relative abundances. So this would be an example of one that doesn't do very well, where sample C is an exact match, and so it, it scores really highly. So that's just, just sort of schematically what these statistics are looking at. And instead of showing you a bunch of different numbers, I thought I'd just sort of show what the zircon age spectra are and what we're seeing in the modern river systems first, and then what we're seeing in, in the ancestral river sandstones that we've collected too. So on the right here, this is a complicated diagram with a whole bunch of detrital zircon age spectra collected from modern rivers. So we've got the Snake River on the top, we've got the Methow River, the Okanagan, and then down here's the Yakima. So those are coming, draining out of the Cascades. We've got the Spokane River, we've got the Columbia River, and the Salmon and the Clearwater. So those are our major modern river systems that we've collected. And one of the really important things that we found is that they all look a little bit different uh, in, the, in the detrital zircon A spectra. And this uniqueness is essential to the province analysis. If we compare sandstone to two rivers and they look exactly the same, then how are we going to possibly tell which one is the most likely contributing uh, region? What we also found is that there's some really diagnostic age groups. Archean ages are really only showing up in any great abundance in the Snake River. Yavapai Mazatsa, we find them in a couple of different places, but again, the Snake River, there's just a whole bunch of them in there. Similarly, the Grenville Ages, those really come out of mostly material that's uh, in the upper Snake River drainage. These are materials that are recycled through different strata that are um, deformed in the Idaho and Wyoming Thrust Belt and the Belt Supergroup, stuff like that. And we also see this Lemhide Dumblet uh, showing up really nicely in the Salmon River here and the Clearwater River here. So again, that's a big age peak here. Um, and the reason why we get a sharp age peak is that there's this very zircon productive um, not, uh, pluton called the Shoup algenice in the salmon and clear water drainages. Um, and so we get a bunch of zircons about that age. And then there's some zircon ages that are also scattered in this, uh, this region right here between about 16 or uh, 50 to 1800 million years. And there's a fewer here in the Salmon River, but they're there, they're, they're just sort of hard to see my um, tiny screen here. So those are the modern river systems. Now, when we look at a bunch of the sandstones, and this is not all my samples, I'm just sort of showing you the, the best examples here. Um, we compared them to each other to see how similar uh, units might be to one another and also to modern rivers. And when we first compared them to each other, we started to notice that the Ringgold Formation, which again is, is in central Washington, was very similar to the Six Mile Creek Formation, which is actually in southwestern Montana, oddly enough. 
both of these, so this is the Ringgold formation, this is two over here, and here's the Six Mile Creek formation, um, and the Mud Ida Pass, which is sort of part of that system too. Uh, these are some of the ages that we're seeing in here were a lot of these Archean ages over here. We see a whole bunch of these Yavapai Mansatsal ages and some of those Granville ages too, right here. Um, see them in the Glens Ferry Formation, um, which is another cool story. And then we see them also in the Manida Pass and the Six Mile Creek Gravels. Um, in Lake Idaho, the samples look like they change over time. So we've got the Chalk Hills Formation uh, shown as this tetrahedral circa and A spectrum in this region. And, the, and that's the older version of Lake Idaho. And then we have the Glens Ferry Formation, which is um, younger. And so if you notice, the Chalk Hills Formation does not have any of these old zircons, but the Glens Ferry Formation does, which is pretty cool because it means that there's a change in source area over the geologic history of just Lake Idaho by itself. And then we had another cool sample, and I will show you what these, where these are on the map in, in just a slide. Um, but one of the samples, it comes from the Clarkston Heights gravels. These are near Clarkston. Um, uh, and so they're right along the modern Snake River, but just downstream of Falls Canyon. And what we saw was that there's this really nice uh, uh, Lemhi doublet showing up here. There's a Shubauga nice showing up nicely and over here, but we don't see those older Archean ages, which should be coming from the Snake River. So the Clarkston Heights gravels, it turns out, were deposited before Hell's Canyon was sized. Okay, now where are these on a map? So here we have the Ringle Formation way over here, and it compared very nicely to some of the um, sandstones that we collected along Monida Pass. So Monida Pass is right here on the Continental Divide, and the Six Mile Creek Formation is here in the Ruby Graben system. And so these are very similar, oddly enough, and that sort of puzzled us for a little while. The Clarkston Heights gravels are located over here. So again, downstream of uh, Hell's Canyon, but along the modern Snake River. Doesn't have any of those upper Snake River zircons that should be coming from this general geographic region. It just has a bunch of stuff coming from central Idaho. Um, so this deposit must have been deposited before Hell's Canyon was in size. And then like Idaho, it changes after about 4.3 million years. Before that time period, during the Chalk Hills time, the zircons were fairly locally sourced from all the different little rivers that are coming into the system. But then over time, or in, in the, the more younger phase of Lake Idaho, we start to get zircons that are sourced from farther afield from the East Snake River Plain and possibly further up in the Idaho and Rust Belt. Okay, so to bring some of these ideas together and try to piece together how we could be getting all these Snake River zircons in the Columbia Basin, um, but not going through the Chalk Hills Formation, not going through this region right here, we compared these ideas to the previous hypotheses. So again, there's the Livingston hypothesis in the, this direction, but we would expect to see if, you know, if the Snake River had gone through here, we would expect to see that the Chalk Hills Formation would have a bunch of those older upper Snake River zircons if that was the path. We don't see that. Furthermore, this Baker Valley um, sample that we have not just fish fossils from, but also the stridal zircons from, also confirmed the Snake River likely did not go through this region um, during the time that these materials were being deposited. Um, so to, to get the zircons there, if they're, if they're not going through the, uh, through the Lake Idaho system, we kind of proposed a new hypothesis um, linking basically the upper Snake River drainages through southwestern Montana over the northern Rocky Mountains and entering into the Columbia Basin from the northeast. So what if this happened instead? Maybe we have a whole new river route that wasn't thought of before necessarily. So this is kind of a funky hypothesis. So we decided to try and test it in a, a, a different sort of way of using the tridal zircons. So there's this pretty cool new application um, called the tridal zircon unmixing. So if we had a sample collected downstream of two different river systems, one of the things we can do with this uh, detrital zircon unmixing technique is estimate the relative contribution of multiple different possible sources to, uh, to that single sample. And so if we put a whole bunch of different modern river samples and we compare them to a river and say like, okay, what contribution did the Snake River contribute to the sample versus the salmon? It'll give us a percentage. And if this uh, percentage is very, very low, it would indicate that that river was perhaps not um, contributing anything to our sample. So we test a few different hypotheses using this. Um, 
So, uh, and this is sort of the model design slide. So I'm, I'm highlighting the upstream drainage areas that we're comparing our um, downstream samples to. So we're mostly using uh, the samples that are collected in the Ringgold Formation downstream to compare them to possible source, uh, sources from the Cascades, from the Northern Rockies, from the Snake River Plain, and from Central Idaho. So if the Baker hypothesis was, Baker Valley hypothesis was correct, then you would have all of these different rivers contributing to the um, Ringgold Formation samples and anything downstream there too. So we tested this by using all of these different um, possible sources, mixing them up and comparing them to our detrital zircon uh, samples from the Ringgold Formation. To test the Sacramento hypothesis, um, that one would again suggest that the Snake River did not flow into the Columbia Basin at all. So basically, we just take it out. Um, we use only the uh, modern rivers uh, as potential sources that are, are highlighted here, basically everything except the Snake River. And then lastly, um, the one to test our new hypothesis is to exclude this lower portion of the Snake River, but use a lot of these great tributaries that have been um, identified and measured up here in the upper portions of the Snake River system and compare those as possible sources along with everyone else to our um, downstream samples. So again, the Ringgold formation and anything downstream. So the way we just do this, and I just wanted to show some graphs of sort of what this looks like. This is an example of a Ringgold formation sample. We can look this as a look at these data as a kernel density estimate, which is what I'm showing here on the bottom. These are similar plots to what I showed previously. And another way to look at this is a cumulative density function. Basically, it's the same data plotted a different way. I just find that the CDFs to look uh, a little bit cleaner sometimes when looking at a whole bunch of different samples layered on top of each other. So again, this little white line here is a Ringgold formation sample. If we look at all the modern rivers, some of them overlap pretty nicely, um, but none of them overlap super well. So instead of using a single river, what we can do is create many, many, many synthetic mixtures of those possible, uh, with all those modern rivers as possible sources and try and get a best fit model that, uh, that overlaps the most with our sample that we actually collected. So this is, um, this you can see this little red line would be our best fit model that comes out of this comparison with one of the Ringgold formation samples. And you can see that it, it overlaps the model or the, the measured sample much better than any of those individual rivers. And then we can look at the relative contribution of uh, those different possible sources and, and figure out sort of who, which river is most important for recreating the, the measured detrital zircons in our sandstones. So comparing our, um, our uh, Ringgold formation and downstream samples to the three different hypothesized networks, we've got the all snake network, the east snake network, and the no snake network. Ugh. You can see that the no snake record no snake network, uh, which excludes the Snake River entirely, doesn't do a very good job of uh, comparing to our Columbia Basin Ringgold samples down here at all. So this basically, these lines just don't really overlap very well over here. So it seems like the Snake River has to, in some way, contribute zircons to the system. When we look at the all snake model, so again, that's the Baker Valley hypothesis, compared to the East Snake model, which is like our new hypothesis, both of them compare really well. These little red lines overlap the white line pretty well. When you look at the nitty gritty statistics, the East Snake River model typically does just a little bit better than the All Snake model. So we, um, we thought that that was uh, really good evidence that the new hypothesized group um, was um, perhaps accurate. And there's also some really cool uh, features that we can figure out more about using this unmixing technique. So here again are the rivers uh, and the river systems that we're comparing to our samples. And some of the things I wanted to highlight from the Columbia Basin are that there's a difference in the relative contribution of rivers in samples from the north compared to samples in the south. <coughs> Excuse me. So on the right, what I'm showing is these are our measured um, and modeled uh, uh, detrital zircon cumulative density plots. And so this is just showing how good these fits are, where the red line and the black line overlap best. It's, you know, that means it's a pretty good fit. And these pie charts are showing the relative contribution of different drainages, and they're all color coded. So purple, purple over here, and green over here is the same as green over here. Um, 
the relative contribution of these different river networks. And so this is graphically showing there's a lot of purple and pink in these uh, northern Ringgold formation samples. So this one and this one come from uh, these two samples located up here. So that suggests that the uh, eastern Snake River Plains zircons and upstream uh, portions of the Snake River are really important contributing factors to these uh, Ringgold formation samples to the north. When we look to the south, this sample over here collected along the White Bluffs, uh, this is a sample over here, P4, we see that there are some you know, important pink contributions, but it's totally swamped by the clear water in the Salmon River, which was actually really surprising to find. And I think what it means is that if the Snake River is coming out through and joining the Columbia Basin from the north, and uh, the clear water in the Salmon River are draining into the south, that there is essentially a Paleo River confluence located in between our north samples and our south samples. So that was cool, kind of cool to see. <clears throat> when we compare um, these different river systems to the Six Mile Creek Formation and the Manaida Pass gravels, those are located in you know, these blue dots over here, we see um, that there's a lot of pinks and purples, basically meaning that this material, uh, material being eroded from this part of the landscape is getting into these samples and, and is making up much of the zircons that we find in those samples. And then way over here, the Clarkston Heights gravels, I probably hammered this home a little bit too much. Here's a sample over here, but it's being, this, this stuff is being mostly derived from the salmon and the clear water. So we've got a lot of red and a lot of orange over here. There's basically no purple. So this, the, these samples must have been deposited before Hell's Canyon was even incised. So to try and put this together, I've come up with a series of uh, sort of uh, just schematic diagrams or schematic little maps of what I think happened over time and the data sets that support that. So we think that about 10 million years ago to 6.5 million years ago that the Snake River flowed from the East Snake River Plain over the Tendori Range um, into southwestern Montana and entered to the Columbia Basin from the Northeast. Um, some of the data that suggests this or, or supports this is that Lake Idaho was, uh, which is right over here, was um, isolated from Lake Ringgold um, at this time period. So there must have been a drainage divide here. The, the, and that's in, in the fossil data sets. The detrital zircon data set suggests that the upper Snake River over here is an important contributor to samples collected from the Columbia Basin and downstream, but that it is not an important contributor to the samples collected in the Chalk Hills Formation. So we don't see those really, really, really old zircon ages in there. Just some local stuff. Funny enough, uh, the Yellowstone hotspot was located at the peak of a volcanic center almost exactly at this time period between about 10.4 to 6.6 million years ago. So we think that uh, dynamic topography or, or rather thermal topography from this uh, big uh, plume underneath um, the Eastern Snake River Plain would have caused this drainage divide between the East Snake River Plain, excuse me, and the West Snake River Plain. So topographic uplift from the Yellowstone hotspot is I think what the agent is in, in dividing these two different uh, systems here. We move, we move a little bit further in time between about 6.5 to 5.5 MA. Uh, the Yellowstone hotspot moves a little bit further east. So it's, this is at the Heise Volcanic Center. The stratigraphic data sets um, are showing that Lake, Lake Ringgold is still going strong. Uh, Lake Idaho seems to have drained or evaporated. The fossil is still showing that, you know, Lake Idaho, what was left of it is not similar to that of Lake Ringgold. And the zircon data set suggests that the Ringgold formation continues to have to have a bunch of zircon sourced from the upper Snake River Basin. So not a lot changed at that time. Um, but after about 5 million years until maybe 3.3 million years ago, we start to see some changes. So Lake Idaho, first of all, came back, got really big. Uh, the zircon data sets suggest that the Glen Sphere formation has a bunch of zircons coming from eastern Snake River Plains. So we think that stuff started to filter in um, and sort of defeat this previous uh, topographic divide between the East Snake River Plain and the West Snake River Plain. This is a time period in which the Yellowstone hotspot sort of had a lull in volcanic activity, perhaps a lull in its topographic effect on the landscape. And there's some separate data from uh, 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 well cores and basalts that have been well dated that suggests that after 4.2 million years ago, the East Snake River Plain subsided fairly substantially compared to the uh, Tendori Range, which is just located on the north side. So, and it, it's thought that crustal densification of the East Snake River Plain, basically a whole bunch of basalt um, that was tacked onto the bottom of the crust there, 
basically became dense enough to cause that subsidence. The amount of subsidence that's estimated uh, after 4.2 MA is 745 meters. And, when, and so this is basically that this, this mountain range over here, relative to um, the East Snake River Plain, the, the East Snake River Plain subsided that much relative to this mountain range up here. When we compare that to the um, amount of elevation between the East Snake River Plain and Manita Pass, um, it's almost identical. <clears throat> so presumably before 4.2 MA, this river system would have been you know, going right over the top here and that this big basin right here uh, didn't exist more or less. So after 3.3 million years ago, we see some procreating deltaic systems in the Western Snake River Plain. Um, the Chalk Hills, uh, or not the Chalk Hills, the Ringgold Formation strata are incised after 3MA. And so what we think happened is essentially that uh, Lake Idaho gained a lot of upstream drainage area once everything sort of started to filter through the Eastern Snake River Plain. It got really big, it overtopped, the, um, the drainage divide between Hills Canyon and uh, the Columbia Basin. We call this sort of a fill to spill model. So at this time period, the fossils and uh, both the fish and the rodent fossils are suggesting that the um, Lake Idaho uh, creatures are almost identical to those found in Ringgold Formation. <coughs> and at this time period, the Yellowstone hotspot is well out of the Eastern Snake River Plain over here. So again, one of the uh, sort of faults, I think, of the previous hypotheses is that they assumed that the Snake River actually flowed into Lake Idaho over its history, but it seems like that didn't happen entirely over that time. Our new detrital zircon data sets suggested that the Snake River actually flowed around the northern Rocky Mountains, circumnavigated the western Snake River Plain, and entered the Columbia Basin from the northeast. This room, again, it circumnavigates the northern Rocky Mountains, and it satisfies not only the provenance data sets on which it's mostly founded, but I think it also satisfies the fossil data sets and the stratigraphic data sets that are found throughout this region. And just as a note on the different uh, drivers of, of uh, dynamic topography in this region and, and topographic evolution, um, it's not just the Yellowstone hotspot that's, um, that's impacting the uh, elevation of these regions. Um, on the right, what I'm showing is a heat flow map showing hot colors in, um, or hot, uh, high heat flow in uh, purples and pinks and low in blue. I'm also so showing an isostatic residual gravity anomaly in that map. And so what you can see is that, you know, the Yellowstone hotspot where it's currently located, is one of the hottest parts of the North American crust, but the Eastern Snake River Plain, it continues to be warm, but it cooled down just enough that this dense material shown by these pink colors and this isostatic residual gravity anomaly map start to really be able to take hold. So we've got two drivers of landscape evolution that are competing and both intricately tied to this landscape evolution in this region. We've got broad uplift from the Yellowstone hotspot. When it's there in the Eastern Snake River Plain, it has a big impact, but as soon as it gets out and the crust starts to cool down a little bit, that local subsidence starts to take over and drive uh, drainage reorganization, reorganization of the Snake River. So based on the time, we think that both, both of these um, uh, effects on isostasy in the region are really important. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. So thank you, Lydia. That was an excellent talk. Wow. Thank great you, time. Lydia. It was great. It's just right. So there's no questions in the chat, but if people want to unmute and ask Lydia some questions, then go ahead. Okay. Could the Yellowstone hotspot have been under the uh, Wallowa Mountains and the Baker Valley and further west at earlier times? The location of the Yellowstone hotspot before then was actually located a little bit south of the Snake River Plain, um, to, further to the west. So it wasn't quite where the Wallowa Mountains were. There, we do think there is some uh, topographic drivers in the Wallowa Mountains, um, but they're a little bit separate, perhaps. Or other spots besides uh, the Yellowstone hotspot to cause the blockage, a very broad uh, type of uh, uplift. Yeah, so one of the ideas in the Wallowa Mountains is that there was a lot of dense material that was um, uh, sort of um, dropped off. So mantle, basically that the mantle of the sphere could have, um, could have come off the base of, of the crust there, and that would have caused a big isostatic um, bullseye effect of uplift in the Wallowa Mountains. But the timing of that 
I think there's a lot of people interested in it. Um, and it, it could be somewhat related to the Yellowstone hotspot. Uh, basically, you know, it's traction on the base of the crust, but um, that is a, another potential driver. So there could be yet another mechanism. We don't know the timing very well, so it's hard to exactly point to that as another, you know, certain driver. Um, but we do have a bunch of colleagues that are actively working on that too. Thank you. Uh, when you collect the uh, zircons, uh, how do you separate them from the rest of the material? Do you use a centrifuge or, or something? <clears throat> we use a few different techniques. So <clears throat> one of the first things we do is we just use a sieve because we know the size that these uh, the zircons tend to be. We sieve them. Uh, we use some magnetic separation. So we want to get the more magnetic minerals out of there. because Some of those also tend to be very dense. Basically, anything with magnesium and iron is going to be fairly dense. And then we use a series of heavy liquids. Um, one is called uh, LMT, which is like lithium metatungstate, I think. And then there's another one called MEI, which is methyl iodide. Um, and these are, they're heavy, heavy liquids. And so you can basically put your um, samples in there once they've been pre-processed. And the dense zircons will sink. And the slightly lighter uh, materials like, um, like LMT can separate the feldspars and the, and the quartzes towards the top, and then everything else sinks. And then uh, zircon and apatite, uh, they have a, um, those are separated from one another using the um, MEI or the methyl iodide. So it's, it's kind of a, a cool uh, lab experiment. Um, some, of the, some of the materials are actually kind of scary to use. MEI is like known to cause like, you know, cancer in women and <laughs> stuff like that. So it's all under a hood and everything like that. But, um, but yeah, it's usually uh, using gravitational separation and heavy liquids and Thank you. Uh, what work is being done to study the potential route of the uh, Snake River through uh, to the Sacramento River? Are they looking at fossils or? Uh, yeah, a lot of it. Or what? A lot of it was based on fossils and um, uh, uh, mollusks and fish, I'm pretty sure. But uh, so I actually last summer after a lot of this work was, you know, in the process of being published, I went out with some of the um, fish fossil specialists and collected some detrital zircons from the various sites that they link to uh, to potential, um, you know, a link, a Sacramento root link. And so those samples are being processed this summer. So we'll, we'll explore that. So one of the things I didn't mention was that Lake Idaho could have had an outlet to the south. We don't really know about it. We don't think the Snake River went that way, but whether or not Lake Idaho could have drained uh, to some other location, um, is, uh, you know, a, an ongoing research topic. So, you know, we, we're, we're looking and working in collaboration with a lot of the uh, fish fossil specialists uh, to know the right sites to sample from. I, I missed an estimate of the date range when the river might have abandoned that northern course. Yeah, so we think it happened. Uh, so the Northern River probably was abandoned after 4.5 to maybe 5 million years ago. And there's some other data sets that are helpful in that. So uh, a lot of them are the basalt units that are uh, being derived from the Yellowstone hotspot and other calderas in the Eastern Snake River Plain. They flow to the north and into the Ruby Mountains. So basically over what we now have as the Android range, they flow to the north until maybe 5 to 4.5 million years ago. And then they start to seem to be diverted and not flow that way. So we think that that, um, that range between about 4.5, around 4.5 million years is when um, the tender range started to experience a lot of uplift. Thank you. Or rather that the East Snake River Plain subsided. It's, it's a relative question, right? <laughs> So uh, I do have a question. Is is okay? Yes. Okay. So what is happening to the west of Hell's Canyon? Um, I had heard that Snake River may have flowed um, to the west, uh, to the Columbia River, rather than to the north or to the south, but uh, before the Blue Mountains formed. Yeah, so that's part of that Livingston hypothesis. Um, okay. Yeah, but so there's a lot of lake strata and volcanic strata in that region, um, but it doesn't look like there was a, when we look at it, it doesn't really look like there was a major river system. Some of, there, there's not a ton of really large gravels in, in those um, sedimentary strata. 
uh, the, the fish fossils are, again, they look like they're isolated from uh, Lake Idaho and they're divergent fossils. So the, the Baker Valley region was isolated and they're not that similar to, well, they're a little bit more similar, but not, not super similar to the Columbia Basin. So exactly how those may have been isolated basin systems, we're, we're not totally sure yet, but um, the detrital zircons also seem to suggest that they were fairly locally sourced. So there, it doesn't seem like there's a big river going through there necessarily. Um, well, some, well some I noticed, other... Go ahead. Oh, excuse me. I, while I was looking very closely at the sampling points um, of, of the zircons, and I was looking for areas around Arlington and the Mackay Formation uh, on the western flanks of the Blues. Yeah, so, so I see a little void there for mm -hmm. sampling. We actually, we did sample there. Um, so what I oh, was okay. showing was just the samples that we used in the analysis. Um, we, but we did sample from the Mackay beds. One of those first fossils that I was showing, um, the, the, what I think might have been an aquatic rhinoceros, that came from the Mackay beds. Um, but all of that material also looks to be fairly locally derived. Um, a lot of the class or basalt, we're not seeing a lot of the green stones that would be coming from upstream or the, or the granites that would be coming from upstream. Um, so yeah, we, we did look into those locations. So my, my sampling map uh, of what I've actually sampled compared to what I've actually analyzed is a bit different, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Can you come up with uh, a reason why the snake, why it went through Hell's Canyon? You have to kind of stop and think. What it um, was there already a crack there or something? Water's water's not going to want to go through that tough basalt if it could go around it. Right. Yeah. So we we think uh, based on the drainage pattern that uh, the material on the south side of Hell's Canyon, those barb tributaries were flowing to the south. And then stuff on the north side was flowing north. So there was probably a wind gap there um, that was just at about the elevation that when Lake Idaho filled up, it just sort of was, you know, the easy, easy way out more or less. So, um, but this is an active, very active um, uh, question that we're, we're exploring. How did Hell's Canyon in size? Was it through headwater erosion or the, the fill and spill model that um, me and my colleagues would suggest? Uh, and one of the things that might relate to it, um, and this is very tentative, um, is that karst topography might be involved. So there's a lot of cave systems <clears throat> in that portion of Hell's Canyon in between the drainage divide. And perhaps there might be some relation to uh, carbonate roof pendants and stuff like that, that could um, have been slightly more easy to erode through. Yeah, must have had some kind of head start mm -hmm. directed yeah. right through there. Yeah, but but what should have initiated it? I we think that the the field of soil model makes sense because we know that Lake Idaho got really big and that uh, we we have some, we also have some caves that um, material has been dated from them, uh, so we can find out sort of how quickly things incised. Um, so so we kind of know where the river level may have been in a couple different periods of time, and and it seems that there was um, there was something there, just not, you know, it was going the opposite direction and then something to sort of made it all connect. Yeah. Um, Harold Hines here. I, I have a, I'm, this has been a fascinating presentation, but given the depth of, of the canyon, it suggests to me that perhaps when the break came, there was a huge volume of water that went through as, as, as the lake drained. Has that been looked at very carefully? Also actively looking at it. So one of the things we're exploring is that um, Lake Ringgold, uh, it seems to have drained out through perhaps Goldendale um, and that the, the Columbia River went in a, in a previous route before it incised through the Wooloola Gap. One of the things we're exploring is whether or not there could be sort of a cascading effect in which Lake Idaho drains and then it fills up the Columbia Basin and then it creates a new route because that is a lot of water to move through a system. And we don't necessarily think that it would have happened catastrophically, but over geolog, you know, it's a relatively short period of geologic time. Um, so yeah, definitely an active question we're, we're trying to figure out. Very good. Are there any more questions?
just an observation. I was a geologist out of Prineville for years, and at the boundary between the John or the uh, John Day and uh, Crooked River on the Bernard Ranch, there's gigantic, like maybe 10, 15 meter deep beds of quartzite cobbles and boulders and stuff spread out through that region that runs for maybe 15, 20 miles across from, uh, which sits over the top of the rattlesnake tuff, which would be at right about the same age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we've looked in a couple locations around there, but um, I've also been pointed to those same gravels to check them out. I haven't quite gotten there yet, but given that I also really like fly fishing, I could probably find my way over there pretty easily um, to collect some gravel and maybe some trout. We'll see. I could send you some uh, waypoints. That would be fantastic, yeah. I'm easy to find online. Yeah, so... Years ago, I went to the Bernard Ranch to ask permission to go look at this large bank of gravel. It was a lot just north of Supli on the highway. And the original Bernard Ranch's fireplace was made out of these gigantic cobbles when I pulled into the yard. So they have a quarry in that on that ranch as well. Perfect. Yeah. Just a quick observation. I lived in oh, sorry. Just a quick observation. I lived in South Africa. And Western Africa under Angola is a big thermal plume and is pushing all the rivers to form the Okavango Delta. Mm -hmm. And so you got that thermal plume. Um, maybe there's people there, there's a lot of geologists in South Africa. Maybe they can find uh, some um, seismic data that shows this plumes pop bubbling underneath Western Angola. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, one of the professors at um, University of Idaho, uh, Jessica Stanley, she's worked in uh, thermal plumes in Africa, and she's now, now she's in Idaho, she's also working on Yellowstone hotspot effects on the crest, too. So, yeah, we've got, we've got boots on the ground on that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> you were on it. <laughs> we try to cover our bases. <laughs> Good. Yep, everybody. Let's see if let's get a reaction here. Okay. <laughs> thank yeah. you. It's been a pleasure to give this talk. Well, thank you. We are delighted to have you. So thank you very much. It was really good. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs>